It's Friday! And in case you're wondering what my hair looks like after I take it out of the little twisty sort of braids I had yesterday, this is it! It gets all fluffy and I feel like a Botticelli painting. Birth of Venus de Milo. I should probably fake one of those. I'm in the painting type pictures that are trending right now by art teachers across the world. Anyway, um, we are back for our next chapter of Kid Artists. Ow, oh, I just pulled my own hair. And today we are learning about Yoko Ono. Look at this hair. Glorious, fluffy hair. This is two days without, no, third day without hair washing. The a little dry shampoo in. And normally my hair gets really greasy, but because it was in those twisties, it was all right. I'm sure that's why you tuned in. Anyway, Yoko Ono, Reversal of Fortune. <clears throat> as an adult, Yoko Ono made the pursuit of peace an important part of her work as an activist and an artist. But back when she was a child, she got a first-hand look at how war can change a family when her comfortable life was upended by the outbreak of conflict between the United States and Japan. On a snowy February night in 1933, Isuki and Isoko Ono welcomed their first child into the world. I might be pronouncing that wrong, but that's I, Isuki and where'd the other name go? Isoko. They called her Yoko, meaning ocean child. It was a fitting name for a girl who would one day sail across the ocean waters, separating her native Japan from her adopted home in the United States. Yoko Ono was born into a wealthy and powerful family. Her mother was the daughter of a prominent nobleman. Her father was a prosperous banker descended from a line of samurai warriors and a 9th century Japanese emperor. That is crazy cool. So there's your dad and then grandfather and great grandfather in his like samurai. Very cool. <clears throat> As a child, Yoko had 30 servants. Her mother preferred to live a life of leisure and her father was often away on business. Yoko was looked after by maids, nannies, and private tutors. It was stifling atmosphere. The servants lived in fear of being fired they were instructed to enter and leave Yoko's room on their knees and to cater to her every whim. Whenever she traveled by train, attendants carrying cotton balls and rubbing alcohol followed after her. Their job was to disinfect any surface that Yoko might sit on. OMG, how handy would that be right now? Not that I want like a bunch of servants following me around with that, but I mean, if I had a little like group of people disinfecting every service for me. I wouldn't complain too much right now. Um, anyway, there's baby Yoko with her servants and their cotton balls and disinfectant spray. I mean, I can't believe how much parts of this book just are connecting to things that are going on right now. It's just so poignant. I don't know. <clears throat> Serendipitous. I don't know. Anyway, Yoko didn't ask or want to be treated this way. Because of her social status, she often felt isolated and alone. She had few friends, and so she would try to play with the servants' children. But that was no fun. They were afraid of doing something wrong that would get their parents in trouble. At dinner time, Yoko ate alone as a, as a servant watched over her in silence. I'm just watching you eat. Don't mind me. But sometimes the domestic workers would try to entertain Yoko. One time, a servant wanted to teach Yoko traditional Japanese children's songs, but when Yoko's mother found out, she was horrified. She considered such peasant music too coarse and common for a girl of a regal background. I refuse to let you hear any more peasant music. Probably made her listen to, like, classical music or something. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but, you know, God forbid she listened to a folk tale song type thing. Ah, <sighs> Isoka Ono resolved to send her daughter to the most exclusive private school she could find. So when Yoko was four years old, her mother enrolled her in Jiu Gakuen, one of the most prestigious girls' school in Japan. It was famous for its music program. 
at Jiu Gakuen, Yoko was exposed to the arts for the first time. She began taking piano and singing lessons. For one homework assignment, Yoko was told to memorize the noises she heard on the street, like a bird singing or a car horn honking, and then translate the sounds into musical notes. It's kind of cool. Maybe like do that, but with paint or drawing, like translate the sounds you hear into lines. At the end of the semester, Yoko gave her first piano recital. She was so nervous that as soon as the concert was over, she ran off stage and threw up. Poor thing. And here she is playing piano. I think I'm gonna Ralph. That's what my dad used to call barfing. And he'd say, do you have a visitor from, did Ralph come and visit you? That's what he'd say. Anyway. At the end of the academic year, Yoko's mother decided that Jiu Gakuen was, wasn't good enough. She transferred Yoko to an even more private school named Gaku Shuin. There, Yoko continued her music studies. She also started drawing and writing haiku, an ancient form of poetry made up of three lines that contained precisely 17 syllables. Ooh, project idea. Yoko's mother also began to teach Yoko how to paint. Sometimes, Isoko Ono's instruction could be overbearing. For example, I just lost my place. <laughs> for example, she had a habit of completing her daughter's assignments for her. Ooh, helicopter parent. One day, Yoko was asked to show one of her paintings to the class, but it was mostly her mother's work. When everybody complimented the painting, Yoko felt embarrassed instead of feeling proud. She couldn't accept praise that she did not deserve. Here's the mom doing the painting for her. You're doing a great job, honey. In 1940, when Yoko was seven, her family moved to the United States. Her father had been transferred to a new job at a bank in New York City. Yoko began learning about American customs and fashions, but the move was not permanent. Soon, Aisuke Ono was transferred again, and the family returned to Japan. Only a year had passed, but much had changed in Tokyo, the Japanese capital. I've been there three times. Um, there were rumblings of war between Japan and the United States, which caused problems for Yoko. She had taken on some new habits from her time in New York and had begun wearing American-style skirts and blouses. Some of the school children taunted her. They called her an American spy and demanded that she wear traditional Japanese clothing. But Yoko refused to be bullied. On December 7, 1941, World War II began when Japanese bombers attacked the American fleet at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. At first, the Ono family's wealth shielded them from many hardships. Yoko's parents had to release a few servants, allowing them to work in hospitals and factories. The Japanese government also made Yoko's mother turn over her diamond jewelry to help pay for the war effort. But otherwise, life went on as usual. I gotta say, I don't feel bad about that. You're losing your servants and your diamond jewelry. But otherwise, life went on as usual. The Onos could afford to have an underground bomb shelter equipped with food and water in case of emergency. So that's a little underground bomb shelter and this place is pretty slick. Looks like a little cabin. Anyway. As the conflict dragged on, however, the family's life began to change. Tokyo was bombed ferociously by American planes, and air raids were more frequent. The Onos were often rousted out of bed at night and sent rushing, in, rushing to hide in their underground bunker. When it was safe again, Yoko would crawl out and watch as fires consumed the houses all around her. Yoko's mother worried about her daughter. She decided to take Yoko out of school and move south to a small farming village far from the heavy bombing. Almost overnight, the Onos went from a grand home full of servants to a tiny farmhouse in a cornfield. The building had no roof, but it was the best they could do. Wow. No downgraded there, huh? I wouldn't mind it. Life in the village was hard. Because of wartime shortages, Yoko and her family had to depend on their neighbors for food, but the local farmers had trouble feeling generous. They wondered, who are these wealthy city people demanding our meager rations? The Onos were forced to beg for food while pulling around all their possessions in a wheelbarrow. Wow, they're really 
started to hit rock bottom there then, didn't they? I guess not total bottom. They also tried expensive, I'm sorry, they also traded expensive jewelry and other items for basic necessities. Her mother bartered a treasured sewing machine for a large sack of rice to feed the family. Yoko began going to school, but again, she was bullied because of her family's wealth. Sometimes farm boys would throw rocks at her, but Yoko refused to back down. I'm glad she stood her ground. It's no reason to bully someone, though, just because they have more money. We should be accepting of all people. Side note. When other children called her names, she shouted back at them. With few friends to help during this difficult time, Yoko began to concentrate on poetry and art. Art allowed me to communicate in a way that didn't require so much courage, she later said. This war took its toll on the Onos, but Yoko's mother encouraged her daughter to rem remember everything she was witnessing. You can write about this one day when it's over, she said. Just the thought that someday the fighting would end... Con the fighting would... I'm going to try that part again. Just the thought that someday the fighting would end comforted Yoko. Thinking about how she could transform her experience into art, she instantly felt better. In August of 1945, World War II ended with as much horror as it began. The United States dropped atomic bombs on two Japanese cities, killing many people. After surrendering, Japan began a long period of rebuilding. Yoko returned to Tokyo and her old school at Gakushuin. One of her new classmates was Prince Akihito, the son of Japan's emperor and the country's future ruler. Let's see here with Prince Akihito. He says, I guess things have changed a lot in your house too. And he's all, you can say that again. Yoko's days of begging for food and dodging bombs were over, but she did not return to her old pampered life. Like many survivors of war, of war she was a different person now. She decided she wanted to be a poet when she grew up. Over time, Yoko would learn to blend words and ideas with images, a style that would come to be called conceptual art. Her performances in music became known throughout Japan and later in England and America. Her marriage to the musician John Lennon from the Beatles in the 1960s brought her even more fame. There was another important consequence of Yoko Ono's reversal of fortune, one whose effects are still felt today. Her wartime experience had left her with a strong distaste for conflict. Pacifism, or the belief that disputes should be settled nonviolently, became an important theme in her art, music, and writing. Her call for peace has inspired many other people to take up the cause, too. And here we see activist Yoko Ono holding up her peace signs to encourage peace. So, um, great story. I, I didn't really know that much about Yoko besides you know, people have mixed feelings about her and her love of John Lennon and maybe breaking up the Beatles, they say. I don't know. But um, I had an idea, and I'm going to look something up just to make sure I say this right. Um, but the first thing, kind of, incorporating poetry and art together. I was thinking you could write a haiku, which is a type of um, poem that follows a certain format. Um, like it said, it was 17 syllables, I believe. Um, I'm looking up five, seven, okay, yeah. So, um, yep, 17, it, it adds up. The first line of the poem, it's a three-line poem. The first line is five syllables, so if you don't remember what a syllable is, it's like, my name is Miss Grace. So that's two syllables. Miss Grace, right? Only two syllables. Um, this, so first line is five, second line is seven, and then the third line is five. So five, seven, five. That equals 17 syllables. And it's not so much about writing sentences. It can be phrases. Matter of fact, I'm going to look up a... Yoko Ono haiku. Yoko Ono. Let's see what I get. Um, maybe something will come up. I'm getting a lot of other ones. I'm not sure if this is Yoko Ono's or not, but here's one. So, 
No, that one's dark. I'm not going to use that one. <laughs> okay. That one's not exactly 575. Okay, I don't have a great example. Let me just look up a haiku. <laughs> I could write one really quick, but I don't want to bore you with mine. All right, here's one. An ocean voyage as waves break over the bow. The sea welcomes, that's two parts, sorry, Well, <laughs> welcomes me. Okay, so those were three lines. An ocean voyage, as waves break over the bow, the sea welcomes me. Here's another one. Refreshing and cool. I'm not good at doing the counting while talking. Refreshing and cool. Love is a sweet summer rain that washes the world. So three lines, five, seven, five. Anyway, once you've got that haiku, you should make a picture to illustrate it. Just one picture to go right next to it to illustrate it. And then, since her type of con uh, conceptual art also included performance aspect, you should perform that haiku for your family or make a little video of it and share that with me. Seeing your haiku and even your art with it. So that is my prompt to you kiddos and adults too if you want. I know my mom's watching this. Mom, if you're out there, write a haiku and illustrate it. I got these drawing talents from someone, lady. All right, um, it's Friday, so I will see you again on Monday, and we are going to be looking at John Mis Michelle Basquiat. I'm super excited for that one. So bye, you guys. Have a good weekend.